promised to be a hell of a storm. Between the rumblings of dissent and the flashes of brutal violence, the ominous clouds of war gathered in the darkening skies over America. Between 1850 and 1860, like the first drops of an approaching thunder shower, volatile political disputes burst into bloody confrontations over issues from which there seemed to be no shelter. In the growing political gloom, all eyes turned to the presidential election of 1860 to see which way the storm would go. It was a confusing election. The ruling Democratic Party could not seem to agree on a candidate. The factional rifts in political thinking reflected the split in the country at large. Complex and highly emotional issues were being hotly debated around the land. Slavery, states' rights, free soil, abolitionism, and secession were words heard frequently during these debates. Opinions were plenty, and solutions were few. One result was the emergence of no less than three Democratic candidates for the office of president. Stephen Douglas was one of them. His philosophy, popular sovereignty, was that states should choose for themselves between being free or slave. John C. Breckinridge was another. A former vice president and U.S. senator, he was outspoken on the right of individual states to govern themselves and, if necessary, to leave the Union. John Bell was the third choice the voters had. A former Whig, now running under the banner of the Constitutional Union Party, Bell never really elaborated his position, saying simply that he stood for the Constitution, the Union, and the laws of the country, whatever that meant. The voters had one other choice. A brand new political party had emerged two years earlier, called the Republican Party, and they nominated a country lawyer and former congressman from Illinois, Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln condemned slavery as a great evil, but carefully avoided proposing that it be abolished. A consummate politician, he tailored his remarks on the issue to the audience he was facing. On the subject of union, however, he was unequivocal. The Union must be preserved at all costs. In the South, he was perceived as a threat, and his name did not even appear on the ballots of many Southern states. When the ballots were counted, the divided Democrats had defeated themselves, and Lincoln stood triumphant with only 40% of the popular vote. For Southern leaders, the die was cast. They had relied on the president, traditionally a southerner, to offset the growing congressional power of the more populous northern states. Now they saw themselves as having few options left. In December of 1860, the state of South Carolina, in a frenzy of political emotion, elected to secede from the Union. Six other states followed in quick succession. Alabama, Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas. The United States of America was united no longer. The southern states were in no position to go to war. 
the population was nine million, one third of whom were slaves and would not fight. The entire industrial output of goods and services in the South did not equal that of New York State alone. It had few railroads, fewer manufacturing facilities, no navy, and for the present, no central government. What it did have was cotton, lots of it. In 1860, the southern states supplied nearly 80% of the world's cotton. Cotton was king, and southerners convinced themselves that no one would dare make war on it. So confident were they that cotton would force European support that southern leaders stopped shipments the moment hostilities began. This unfortunate decision cost them much needed revenue at a time when the blockade would have been unable to interfere. By the time the mistake was realized, Union warships were in place along the coasts and exports were impossible. Another thing the South had was native sons with impressive military credentials. Many of the nation's best army officers were from the South and simply could not reconcile raising their swords against their home states if called upon to choose. And there would be plenty of volunteers to serve under them when the time came. Many Southern boys had been raised riding horses and shooting rifles, and the South was liberally sprinkled with military academies. The North had a population of 25 million, no slaves, and most of the manufacturing plants, railroads, merchant marine vessels, and financial resources. It also had Abraham Lincoln. And as time progressed, this would turn out to be a greater asset than anyone suspected in 1860. Lincoln had barely taken office when a crisis developed in Charleston Harbor. In the harbor was a bastion known as Fort Sumter garrisoned by a handful of federal soldiers under the command of Robert Anderson. Surrounding the fort were newly placed batteries under the command of Anderson's former student of artillery at West Point, Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard. Beauregard called upon Anderson to surrender the fort. Anderson refused. On April 12, 1861, under orders from the governor of South Carolina, the southern guns opened fire. After 14 hours of bombardment, the fort surrendered. There had been no casualties. It was a deceptively bloodless beginning to what would become the deadliest war in America's history. Lincoln wasted no time in calling for 75,000 volunteers to put down the rebellion, and young men of military age rushed to enlist. Lincoln's call quickly drove more states into the Confederate camp, Tennessee, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Virginia. A substantial portion of the western part of Virginia disagreed with Richmond, and two years later joined the Union as a separate state, West Virginia. Four states remained divided in their loyalties, Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri. These states became known as border states and contributed men to both sides. The newly elected president of the Confederate States of America, Jefferson Davis, responded with a call for his own armies, a hundred thousand in all, and the Sons of Dixie replied enthusiastically. On both sides, men came by the tens of thousands. Local militia companies were combined into regiments, then divisions, then into armies. They were farmers, shop owners, Schoolboys, teachers, craftsmen, sailors, politicians, thieves, pickpockets, cabinet makers, doctors, actors, firemen, clergymen, masons, mechanics, jewelers, and unemployed laborers. They were rich, poor, and middle class. Many were of foreign birth, Irish, German, British, and French. They reflected the diverse and dynamic cultural texture of the young American society. They brought with them a youthful exuberance, a rampant patriotism, 
and a complete ignorance of what war was all about. Most expected the whole thing to be over in 90 days. One big battle, they said, and it would all be over. In fact, their biggest fear was that they would not get to the front in time to be a part of it. The last American war had been the Mexican War, fought 12 years earlier, thousands of miles away, on foreign soil, and with relatively few casualties. Most of these boys had been children at the time. But war had changed, in dramatic and deadly ways, though few realized it at the time. The biggest difference had occurred in weaponry. Prior to 1850, the standard military musket was a smooth-bore muzzle loader with an effective range of maybe 150 yards. Against such weapons, the most effective tactic was to mass men together and rush your enemy with fixed bayonets, who could only fire once or twice before you were on top of him. By 1850, however, the muskets became grooved or rifled, increasing their range to well over 500 yards. Since no body of men could run that far and still be in fighting condition at the end, an entrenched enemy could now fire a dozen or more times, with greater accuracy, before contact could be made. The consequences of this refinement soon became horrifyingly apparent on the battlefield. Artillery was also being rifled, giving the field guns a range of up to 5,000 yards, and larger weapons even greater ranges. The solid brick forts that had seemed so safe in the past could now be quickly reduced to rubble by these powerful guns. In spite of these improvements and others that came during the war, field tactics did not change. Many generals, trained in classic Napoleonic maneuvers, were slow to change their ways, and soldiers were drilled constantly in the shoulder-to-shoulder, -shoulder, stand up formations that made them so vulnerable. A regiment was made up of 10 companies, each nominally 100 men, and at full strength the regiment numbered 1,000 men and officers. Sickness, desertion, and battle casualties quickly reduced these numbers, however, and within a year of taking the field, the average regiment on both sides counted from 350 to 400 men for duty. The standard battle formation was two ranks deep and a regiment of this size would stretch perhaps a hundred yards from end to end. In the north, generally speaking, three regiments made up a brigade, or about 1,200 men, and this unit soon became the basic tactical formation on the field. Three brigades, or about 4,000 men, made up a division, and usually three divisions, or roughly 12,000 men, were combined to form an army corps, and any number of corps could make up an army. Southern organization differed only in that Confederate brigades contained at least five regiments, or about 2,500 men. And divisions contained five brigades, or about 12,000 men. This meant fewer or larger units with a more unified command structure. In addition, the Confederate cavalry was organized as a separate arm right from the start while Union cavalry was dispersed among various brigades and divisions, reducing its effectiveness. Leading the rebel horsemen were a collection of flamboyant and daring cavaliers whose innovative tactics and willingness to take risks combined to easily outride and outfight the uncoordinated Yankee cavalry for the first several years of the war. The first test of arms of any real scale came in July of 1861, three months after the firing on Fort Sumter. Pressured by the governments and populations on both sides, amateur and barely trained armies converged on the rolling hills bordering a small stream in northern Virginia known as Bull Run. The Confederates were encamped there to protect the nearby town of Manassas, an important rail link between the Shenandoah Valley and Richmond. The federal commander, Erwin McDowell, knew his men were not ready for combat and had resisted the political and public pressure. But faced with the expiration of many 90-day enlistments, McDowell reluctantly agreed to go south. On July 16, 1861, 
35,000 Yankee volunteers left their camps in Washington, crossed the Potomac, and marched leisurely southward. Waiting for them was McDowell's old classmate, the now familiar Pierre Beauregard. The Confederates had about 16,000 troops along the banks of Bull Run, equally untrained, equally amateur. But the Manassas Gap Railroad led directly to the Shenandoah Valley, where Joseph Johnston and 10,000 more troops were stationed. When spies in Washington brought the news that McDowell was on the move, word was flashed to Johnston, who skillfully eluded the Federals assigned to keep him there and boarded the trains for Manassas. First units began arriving July 20th, and with just a little more time, they would all be collected. McDowell's Green soldiers were giving Johnston that time, marching south casually, stopping to pick berries, and resting by the roadside whenever the mood struck them. It took the Yankees a full week to cover the 25 miles to Bull Run. The fight that followed was characterized by confusion and error. No American had ever commanded armies of that size before, and as a result, the commanding officers tended to commit units piecemeal. To confound things further, uniforms had not been standardized, and some southern units wore blue, while some northern units wore gray. Militia units wore all manner of colors, and no one knew who they belonged to. All this could have been sorted out by checking flags, except that the rebel banner, a hundred yards away and shrouded in battle smoke, looked so much like the federal banner that it was often mistaken for it. On July 21st, 1861, the Yankees attacked the rebel left and gained the initial advantage. As the rebels fell back, an eccentric professor of artillery from Virginia Military Institute, named Thomas Jackson, held his brigade in steady reserve. One Southern officer, seeing Jackson's troops, cried to his men, There stands Jackson like a stone wall. Rally behind the Virginians. Jackson had a nickname, and the South had a hero. The Confederates rallied. Johnston's Valley troops bolstered the line. The Federal advance stalled, and the fight began to swing the other way. The Southern line surged forward, and the Yankees collapsed, most of them racing for the rear. A rear guard action by the regular army troops prevented the army's total destruction, but the victory went to the Confederates. The Battle of Bull Run, or Manassas, as the South called it, was a watershed event in American history. The 5,000 casualties shocked both sides, but such numbers would be considered a skirmish by later standards. The armies were the largest Americans had ever seen, but Gettysburg would witness three times their number on the field. The five hours of combat had exhausted the inexperienced men, but the fighting around Spotsylvania Courthouse just three years later would rage continuously for eight days. It had been a tragedy, but it was only the beginning. As the defeated and demoralized bluecoats straggled back to Washington, both sides realized they were in for a long and desperate war. McDowell was quickly relieved, and a young new general, George Brinton McClellan, took over. Arrogant, egotistical, McClellan was quickly styled Little Napoleon by the press. He relished the praise, writing to his wife that, by some strange operation of magic, I seem to have become the power of the land. He began the task of transforming the rabble of volunteers into an army, a job for which he displayed substantial talent. His ability on the battlefield would prove to be another matter altogether. In the area of the country that would become known as the Western Theater, there had been several smaller skirmishes, but the first major battle was yet to come. The opening rounds in this arena were dominated by a nondescript little man from Illinois with an undistinguished background. His name was Ulysses S. Grant, and he held the rank of Brigadier General of Volunteers. A West Point graduate, he had left the Army under a cloud, 
and had failed in several civilian endeavors. When the war started, he offered his services to the federal government, who didn't want him. Finally, the Illinois state governor made him the colonel of a troublesome regiment, which he handled well. The army needed experienced officers badly in 1861, and with the governor's help, he soon received a promotion to brigadier. Now, as 1862 began, he led a combined force of infantry and naval forces into northern Tennessee to attack two forts on the Tennessee and Cumberland rivers. The first of these, Fort Henry, unfinished and swamped by recent rains, fell quickly to the gunboats. The second, Fort Donelson, was a tougher mark, but it too succumbed to Grant's forces. When the fort's commander asked Grant for terms, Grant replied, no terms but an immediate and unconditional surrender can be accepted. The victory brought Grant immediate national attention and a promotion to Major General. The rebels fell back to Corinth, Mississippi, and the North finally had something to cheer about. Grant wanted to follow his beaten foe vigorously, but the Union High Command ordered him to proceed cautiously. Two Union columns, one under Grant and one under Don Carlos Buell, moved south towards Corinth with agonizing slowness. While the Western forces maneuvered, an event of tremendous significance took place along the eastern seaboard. Norfolk, Virginia was a major seaport and shipbuilding yard. When the Union forces evacuated it in 1861, they burned the yard and the ships in it, including a steam frigate called the Merrimack. When the rebels moved in, they found the frigate had burned only to the waterline and that the engines were intact. They raised the vessel and converted it into a revolutionary design with sloping sides. Covered with iron sheathing, it became known as an ironclad and was renamed the Virginia. Word of this project reached the north and the government quickly ordered an immigrant engineer by the name of John Erickson to proceed with plans he had submitted earlier for an ironclad ship. Erickson's design was even more radical than the Confederate version and incorporated many revolutionary design features, including a rotating gun turret. On March 8, 1862, the completed Virginia steamed out of its berth and in short order destroyed the Union blockade ships Cumberland and Congress and ran the Minnesota aground. Washington panicked. Suddenly, every wooden ship in the world was obsolete, and the Lincoln administration feared the rebel craft would sail up the Potomac and bombard Washington itself. By an incredible coincidence, however, the Erickson ship, called the Monitor, was being towed to Charleston, South Carolina, and put into Norfolk for the night that same day. The burning ships told the story of the fight that day as the strange craft entered the harbor. The next morning, when the Virginia came out to finish off the Minnesota, the Monitor was there to greet it. For four hours, the two iron ships pounded each other, sometimes actually touching. The fight was inconclusive, and neither side gained any advantage. The Confederate threat had been neutralized, however, and the blockade was resumed. The two ships had revolutionized naval warfare forever, and countries all over the world rushed to build their own ironclad warships. Meanwhile in Tennessee, things were coming to a head. The Confederate commander, Albert Sidney Johnston, realized that his best chance for victory lay in attacking the separate Union columns before they could reunite. By April 5, 1862, he had moved his army to within a mile of the federal camp at Pittsburgh Landing on the Tennessee River. Amazingly, Grant and his officers, including one William Tecumseh Sherman, brushed aside reports of the rebels' presence and failed to take precautions against surprise attack. At dawn the following morning, Johnston's army burst out of the woods and fell on the Yankees, many of whom were just making breakfast. The sledgehammer assault overwhelmed the Union camps quickly. Whole units scattered after firing only a few shots. 
the Confederates rolled forward, pushing everything in front of them. Some of the Yankees rallied behind a rail fence and were joined by others from the rear. Union General Benjamin Prentiss organized a sturdy defense that successive Confederate attacks could not break through. The Union position was dubbed the Hornet's Nest by the rebels, and it wasn't until late in the day when they surrounded it that the Yankees finally gave up. Grant had used the time gained by Prentiss to organize a final defensive line near the landing, and the now exhausted rebels could not break through. Overnight, Buell's forces arrived to reinforce Grant, and the strengthened Yankees counterattacked the next day, regaining their shattered camps and driving the rebels off. In the middle of the battlefield was a Methodist church called Shiloh Church, and the battle soon became known as the Battle of Shiloh. Shiloh's casualties made Bull Run look like a walk in the sun. Two days of savage fighting had taken nearly 24,000 men from the ranks of both sides, with 3,500 killed on the field. One casualty was especially saddening to the Confederates. In the midst of the fight, the Army commander, Albert Johnston, had been wounded on the field and bled to death while his doctor was off tending to Union wounded neither side had been prepared for such slaughter and rushed to organize hospital and medical departments to treat the wounded. After Johnston died, the command of the Western Army, called the Army of Mississippi, had fallen to a man who seemed to be everywhere in this war, Pierre Beauregard. Beauregard had tried to stem the federal counterattack, but in the end was forced to lead his army back to Corinth to recover. The end of April saw one more federal triumph as Admiral David Farragut captured the Gulf port of New Orleans. Both ends of the Mississippi were now in Union hands and Confederate seaports were slowly disappearing. George McClellan had finally agreed to move his army. After months of organizing, training and equipping his force of over 100,000 men around Washington, he approached Lincoln with a plan to move by sea to Fort Monroe, then up the peninsula towards Richmond, while another army approached the southern capital by land from the north. Frustrated by the lack of movement, Lincoln agreed. By the beginning of April, McClellan was moving up the peninsula towards Richmond. Confederate commander Joseph Johnston hurried to gather his forces near the capital to stop the Yankees. The cautious McClellan took his time advancing. He constantly petitioned Washington for more troops, claiming his 110,000 men were not enough to defeat the rebels. In fact, he outnumbered Johnston's men two to one, but he was easily deceived by faulty intelligence and delayed by the more aggressive rebel rear guard. Johnston's men were in place when the Yankees arrived at the gates to the city. The land around eastern Richmond is crisscrossed by many streams, and when torrential rains placed swollen rivers between two portions of McClellan's army, Johnston attacked the smaller portion at White Oak Swamp. While otherwise inconsequential, the battle did result in one significant development. Johnston was wounded, and Jefferson Davis replaced him with his then military advisor, Robert E. Lee. While McClellan was whining about the need for more troops, one of the heroes of 1st Manassas, Stonewall Jackson, was about to demonstrate what a bold commander could achieve with only a small force. Near Fredericksburg were 40,000 Federals under the command of Irwin McDowell. Their assignment was to advance on Richmond from the north, forcing the Confederates to fight enemy columns from two directions. Just as this force began to move south, Jackson struck in the Shenandoah Valley. On May 23rd, with just 18,000 men, 
Jackson fell on a detachment of Union troops near Front Royal, smashing them. The Federal Valley commander, Nathaniel Banks, was a few miles away in Strasbourg. Pressing the attack, Jackson's men crushed the Union force, and the blue line broke and ran. They kept on running, all the way to the Potomac, and the valley was Jackson's. The reaction in Washington was characteristic. Fearing an attack on the capital, Lincoln immediately halted McDowell's southern advance and redirected him west towards the valley. Over the next 30 days, Jackson's men would march 400 miles, earning the nickname the Foot Cavalry, and fight five pitched battles against Union forces whose combined strength outnumbered them more than four to one. They would win them all. When it was over, the pincer movement on Richmond was in a shambles. The Shenandoah was, for all intents and purposes, cleared of federal soldiers for two years, and the 80,000 troops sent to fight Jackson were scattered and demoralized. Jackson then quietly turned and marched southeast to rejoin Lee's army in the fight against McClellan. It was a brilliant campaign, characterized by audacity and courage, and it marked Jackson as one of the South's premier generals. It was now June 26th. Lee turned his attention to the lethargic Union Army sitting outside Richmond. With an audacity matching that of Jackson, he hurled his men at McClellan's forces. For seven days, Lee attacked and McClellan retreated. In most of these fights, Lee's attacks were repulsed. Southern casualties also exceeded those of the Bluecoats. But McClellan was overwhelmed and fell back as fast as he could. A week later, his army was cowering on the banks of the James River under the cover of Union gunboats. The little Napoleon was whipped, even though the bulk of his army was intact. Lincoln's frustration with McClellan was driving him to distraction. With a vast superiority in men and materiel, McClellan had managed to get himself bottled up on the James River, and Lee was free to direct his attentions elsewhere. The year that had started so well for the Yankees was taking an unpleasant turn. Out west, there had been some command changes on the Union side. After the near disaster at Shiloh, Ulysses Grant was almost relieved of his duties. Taking direct command was the department commander, Henry Halleck. Well-educated and extremely knowledgeable on the tactics and theory of war, Halleck was widely known as Old Brains. As a field commander, however, he bore more resemblance to McClellan than to Jackson. Determined to avoid a repeat of the surprise at Shiloh, he marched his army at a snail's pace, entrenching every night. The result was that the advance to Corinth, only 25 miles away, took nearly a month. As the Union forces neared the rail center, Beauregard withdrew, abandoning the town. Jefferson Davis was not pleased by this and reassigned him to Seacoast defenses in the Carolinas in June. He gave command of the army to a quarrelsome general named Braxton Bragg, a man with an unfortunate talent for alienating his subordinates and an uncanny knack for turning victory into defeat. Bragg's marching orders were simple. Strike. An offensive into Tennessee was the preferred plan, and Bragg set about to make it happen. To keep the Yankees off balance, two large-scale cavalry raids were launched. John Hunt Morgan and Nathan Bedford Forrest ranged far and wide, causing destruction and concern among the Federals, who pursued them unsuccessfully. While Bragg planned and rebel horsemen raided, Lincoln was looking for ways to retrieve Federal fortunes in the East. He collected the pieces of the armies that Jackson had scattered into a new army and called it the Army of Virginia. At its head, he placed a bombastic general named John Pope. Pope had assisted in the capture of Island Number 10 in the Mississippi and had powerful political connections in Washington. Assuming command, Pope declared that, in the West, we always see the backs of our enemy. This insult to the courage of the Eastern soldiers did not bode well for future cooperation between Pope and his subordinates. 
Pope planned to strike south towards Richmond, along the route McDowell had intended to take. Lee moved swiftly north, leaving only a token force to watch McClellan, and sent Stonewall Jackson and his corps around Pope's flank to strike behind the federal lines at the supply depot of Manassas. What Jackson's men couldn't carry away, they burned, and then disappeared as quickly as they had appeared. Pope whirled about and hurried to trap Jackson, but he couldn't find him. While Pope searched, Lee joined Jackson with the rest of the army. On August 28th, Jackson sprung the trap on the old Manassas battlefield. Pope attacked for a full day without success, while Longstreet moved undetected in the position. When Pope attacked the next day, Longstreet fell on his flank with tremendous force, smashing the federal ranks. Once again, a determined stand by the regulars prevented a second Bull Run disaster. And once again, Yankees retreated into Washington defeated and demoralized. Lincoln began to despair of ever finding a general who could stand up to Lee. Lee would give him no rest and now began to move his army north onto Yankee soil. By moving into Maryland and Pennsylvania, he hoped to win a decisive victory and convinced the wavering European powers to recognize the Confederacy. Support for the rebels was widespread overseas. Indeed, English shipyards had been building Confederate ships for some time, and the Union ambassador had his hands full trying to interdict supplies flowing from Britain to the south. The cutoff of cotton had caused many of the British textile mills to close, resulting in unemployment and economic hardship that put strong social and political pressure on the English government to recognize the Confederacy and go to its aid. America's growing industrial muscle also threatened Britain's economic leadership in the world, and there were many in England who would have been happy to see the United States permanently split in two. Lee's hopes were based on real possibilities. Lincoln knew this. The perception that the North could not win was growing in Europe, and another defeat, especially on northern soil, could easily be a disaster for the North that was irretrievable. But Lincoln was a shrewd politician. He was preparing a document that would make European intervention highly unlikely. The document was the Emancipation Proclamation. Issuing the Emancipation Proclamation would make any alliance with the Confederacy an alliance with slavery, a political stand no European nation would take. But he needed a victory to issue the proclamation, or the document would appear to be a desperate ploy by a losing side. Without a military victory, the document was a toothless tiger. The Confederates were doing everything they could to deny Lincoln that victory. Even as Lee swung his columns north, Bragg also set out for points north. Buell's Union Army had been advancing lethargically towards Chattanooga, a key city to the Confederates. In Chattanooga was a Confederate army under Kirby Smith, Smith did not want to sit in Chattanooga waiting for Buell, and he and Bragg hatched a plan to invade Kentucky. By July 30th, the rebels had moved into that state and captured the town of Lexington, along with 4,000 Federals and 10,000 stands of arms. The mood in Washington was gloomy, with Confederate armies advancing on all fronts and no one apparently able to stop them. Buell was following Bragg slowly, with no obvious plan to catch the Confederates. Command confusion existed on both sides, however, and finally the two armies simply blundered into each other near Perryville, Kentucky, on October 8, 1862. The entire Perryville campaign had been characterized by errors, misunderstandings, and chance meetings, and the climax to this saga was no exception. Smith and Bragg were not cooperating well, and Buell's troops were almost as disorganized. Both armies were split into unequal groups, and neither managed to consolidate against the other. 
The rebels ended the day's fighting with a slight advantage, but withdrew as federal reinforcements arrived. In the end, they had created a total of 7,000 casualties, but little else. Nevertheless, Bragg's invasion came to an end. He retreated with his army back into Tennessee. Lee's movement north had begun in early September. While morale in the rebel ranks had never been higher, not all the men were anxious to invade. Many felt they had signed up to defend their homes, not invade the north, and quickly dropped out of the ranks. In all, nearly 15,000 men failed to cross the Potomac into Maryland. And Lee, even with reinforcements from Richmond, took less than 50,000 men into the border state. The news of the invasion sent Washington into yet another panic. With few options after Second Manassas, Lincoln turned again to George McClellan. Little Mac reorganized the army quickly, and on September 5th, sent 84,000 men in three columns northwest into Maryland. But a tiger does not change his stripes so quickly, and McClellan's advance averaged only six miles per day, giving the bold Lee time to mature his plans. Lee's plans seemed to be an invasion of Pennsylvania, with Harrisburg as a principal target. To protect his supply lines, however, he first had to clear the federal garrison out of Harper's Ferry. Banking on McClellan's caution to give him time, Lee divided his army into four parts, sending three under overall command of Stonewall Jackson to converge on Harper's Ferry. The fourth under Longstreet would remain at Boonesboro, where the army was to reunite before continuing north. The plan was well executed and probably would have worked had not fate intervened. On September 12th, two soldiers of the 27th Indiana discovered three cigars wrapped in a sheet of paper. The paper turned out to be a copy of Lee's orders detailing the movements of the divided elements of his army. Recognizing its importance, the soldiers forwarded the document to their commander, who passed it up the chain of command. When it arrived at McClellan's headquarters, he read it with glee. Now he knew where Lee's forces were and how vulnerable they were. He telegraphed Lincoln that he had all the plans of the rebels and will catch them in their own trap. He promised to send you trophies. But even armed with such information, McClellan delayed his response until the next day, time that would prove crucial. From a sympathetic civilian present at McClellan's headquarters when the captured orders came in, Lee quickly learned of McClellan's intelligence coup. He briefly considered canceling his plans and returning to Virginia. Just then he received news that Harper's Ferry had fallen, and he reconsidered ordering his scattered forces to regroup near Sharpsburg, Maryland, along the banks of Antietam Creek. His forces were shielded from the Federals by the South Mountain Range, and the small detachments guarding the passes through the mountain would have to give Lee the time he needed to concentrate. The Union forces arrived at the mountain passes on September 14th and attacked the Confederate defenders there immediately. The rebels fought hard, however, and McClellan's corps commanders seemed to catch his spirit of caution. The patchwork defense held the Yankees off for an entire day and proved to be the decisive time factor. By September 15th, Lee had collected 18,000 men at Sharpsburg, and that night, McClellan arrived with nearly 60,000. Still running true to form, McClellan spent the entire day on the 16th surveying the rebel positions and making his plans instead of attacking. His best chance to crush Lee slipped away. That night, Jackson arrived from Harper's Ferry, bringing Lee's force to 40,000. The next day, September 17th, would go down in history as the bloodiest day in American military experience. Starting at dawn, McClellan launched three separate attacks. The first fell on Lee's left flank in Miller's cornfield and raged for three hours.
Cornfield changed hands 15 times that morning. Lee shifted men expertly to meet each new threat, but he had few reserves and was forced to weaken the right flank to strengthen the left. By midday, the focus shifted to the Confederate center, where a sunken road provided rebel troops with a shallow trench. Attacking Federals were mowed down in waves as successive assaults failed. Finally, a misunderstood order created a momentary gap in the rebel line, and flanking Federals drove them out of position. The ground was covered with bodies. Nearly 6,000 men fell in just under three hours. The final phase centered around a bridge that crossed Antietam Creek close to Sharpsburg. Called Rohrsbach Bridge after a local farmer, its name would soon become Burnside's Bridge after the federal commander whose 12,000 men struggled to cross it for hours. Only 600 men of Robert Toombs' brigade stopped them. Eventually, Burnside's men forced their way over and surged towards the town of Sharpsburg. Capturing the town meant cutting Lee off from his only line of retreat. The southern commander had stripped his right flank and had no one left to stop them. At that critical moment, A.P. Hill's division, the last to leave Harper's Ferry, completed the 17-mile march from that town and arrived in precisely the right place on the battlefield at precisely the right moment. Catching Burnside's troops on their flank, Hill drove them back to the bridge. Lee's army had escaped destruction by the narrowest of margins. The casualties for a single day were staggering. 23,000 men lay killed, wounded, or missing. Lee's army was exhausted. Their heroic fight had succeeded only because McClellan believed their numbers to be three times what they were and held back 30,000 troops to defend against the counterattack he was so sure was coming, but which Lee could not possibly mount. Lee retreated back to Virginia on the 19th. McClellan was left in possession of the field, and Lincoln knew it was as close to a victory as he was going to get. With both Confederate invasions thwarted, he decided the time had come and issued the Emancipation Proclamation to be effective January 1st, 1863. At the time it was issued, the document had more to do with political considerations than the issue of freedom. It freed the slaves only in those states currently in rebellion against the Union. The border slave states were not included for fear of alienating their citizens and driving them into the Confederate camp. Its enforcement would depend entirely on the presence of federal armies, and at the time, federal armies controlled only a small portion of the states affected. It accomplished its primary purpose. It kept England and France out of the war. And as federal troops expanded control over southern territory, it accomplished its secondary purpose the de facto abolition of slavery. 1862 had thus far been a very bloody year, but it was not over yet. McClellan's failure to pursue Lee and destroy his army finally drove Lincoln to take action. After a visit to the battlefield and a conference with the Union general, Lincoln removed him permanently from command. The new leader of the Army of the Potomac would be the reluctant Ambrose Burnside. Burnside had been offered command before, but had wisely turned it down. Now he was ordered to the post, and he had no choice but to accept. He was out of his depth, and he knew it. Still, he labored to get a campaign underway, deciding to strike directly at the city of Fredericksburg. At the time, the city was only lightly defended, 
and if the Yankees moved quickly, they could slip across before the rebels arrived. As he had demonstrated at Antietam, however, Burnside was not known for moving quickly. Although his army arrived on schedule, his pontoon bridging equipment did not. By the time he was ready to cross the Rappahannock, Lee's entire army was in place across the river and waiting for him. The battle that followed illustrated beyond any doubt Burnside's lack of imagination on the battlefield. Wave after wave of federal soldiers bravely assaulted the rebel works on the hills just beyond the town. Rebel troops stood five deep behind a stone wall on Marie's Heights, and the Yankees never got within a hundred yards. For hours, Burnside poured men into the hopeless fight. 12,000 Union soldiers were cut down trying to breach that line, and many took cover behind piles of bodies of their comrades who had fallen before them. The Confederates suffered only 5,000 casualties and gained the most lopsided victory of the war. It was the Eastern Army's last effort of the year, and it did little to raise Northern morale. In the West, one last confrontation was shaping up. After Perryville, Buell had been replaced by a popular officer, William S. Rosecrans. The Confederate forces, now called the Army of Tennessee, were still led by Bragg and were camped around Murfreesboro in Tennessee. Rosecrans decided on Christmas Day that he would attack Bragg and march south, arriving December 29, 1862. Ironically, the two commanders decided on identical tactical battle plans, each plan to hold his enemy's left while attacking the right. On December 31st, the fighting began. Bragg's forces got a jump on the Yankees, and their dawn assaults continued all day, bending the Union line back into a horseshoe. The Union men fought ferociously and prevented the rebels from breaking the line altogether. But by nightfall, the rebels could claim a tactical victory, having pushed the Union forces out of their positions. Two days later, fighting erupted again, with each side attacking and failing to achieve any real advantage. The battle ended in a draw. Two days of savage fighting resulted in a little over 18,000 killed and wounded. But in the end, it was Bragg who retreated, leaving the Yankees in control of the field and ultimately of most of Tennessee. One final campaign got its start in 1862. The redoubtable Ulysses Grant began a series of frustrating attempts to approach the Mississippi River fortress of Vicksburg. He was unsuccessful but his probing signaled the Union commander's focus on the South's last link with the Trans-Mississippi region of the Confederacy. 1862 had been a busy and very costly year. Shiloh, the Peninsula Campaign, Second Manassas, Antietam, Perryville, Fredericksburg, and Stones River. The storm had unleashed its fury over obscure towns and remote fields that now became household words with grim implications. More than 250,000 lives had been washed away by the deluge, and the war was less than two years old. Everywhere the Confederate armies had either been victorious or had battled the Yankees to a standstill. European intervention had been only narrowly averted. Southern resourcefulness had neutralized Union advantages in manpower and materiel. There were those in the North who were beginning to wonder if they could win this war. There were those in the South who were determined to convince them that they could not. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.